So when we talk about um, macromolecules in our body, the most important ones are proteins. Proteins can take a whole bunch of forms, um, but the two main types are globular proteins and fibrous proteins. Uh, so for globular proteins, um, they can come in compact and rounded shapes, uh, or they could be water soluble. Compact and rounded shapes are usually enzyme proteins, and water soluble proteins are usually antibodies, so that the antibodies can you know disperse through our bloodstream better. Now with fibrous proteins, they're usually made used for structural purposes. Uh, for instance. Collagen, keratin, and elastin are all um, proteins in our bodies, I believe, that help with uh, some structures. For instance, I think collagen is like the, um, the, the, what do you call it? It's, it's just very elastic and elongated, and so it allows for more flexibility in the body and in the cells. Uh, so the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Now, um, the simplest amino acid is, of course, glycine, which is here. And all amino acids have common structures. So the only thing that varies in amino acids is this R group. And glycine is just an H. But in other um, amino acids, it could be, for instance, a ring, um, another nit uh, nitrate group, something like that. Uh, all amino acids have this amine group and a carboxyl group and a carbon thing here. <laughs> so the way proteins are actually formed is through the linkage of multiple amino acids, usually in the hundreds or thousands. And how the amino acids actually combine are condensation reactions, which means that the water, water is actually produced as a byproduct. So the example here is glycine plus another amino acid, which I don't know the name of. And here you can see that there's a hydroxyl group right here, OH, and the H. Now when you combine these two together, you get water, which is how these two join up. When the OH and H join up, it makes H2O, and then there are bonds on the carbon and the nitrogen that are able to connect to each other, forming something called a peptide bond. Now the way to remember the difference between a peptide bond and let's say a ester bond for other things is that the peptide bond has basic all the the atoms that is that are found in the human body, the four most common ones. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. So this is a peptide bond. And the interesting thing to note about amino acids is that they can be polar, nonpolar, or electrically charged. Now this is actually dependent on the site groups. For example, we can see that Glycine as a whole is nonpolar for because the side groups are just two hydrogens and therefore they exert they don't really have a electronegative difference. Uh, polar uh, amino acids would usually include uh, more COOH groups or more benzene ring groups. And then electrically charged groups are something different. They have some other side group that might produce might cleave off a hydrogen to you know have a negative charge. And some, mostly these exist as Witter ions, which are when they're electrically neutral at certain pHs, but then they are positive and negative in other pHs, where it, uh, depending on the acidity or the basic nature of the environment. Now, in the cell membrane, there are many examples of polar and nonpolar proteins, and one of the most common examples is the channel protein. Now, channel proteins have two components, polar and nonpolar uh, sides. The polar sites are actually found in the middle of the channel protein, and the nonpolar sites are found on the surface of the channel protein. And this is due to the fact that water dissolves polar substances. Therefore, in order for water not to damage uh, channel proteins, nonpolar proteins must coat the polar proteins in order so that the channel proteins won't actually break down and then break, yeah, you know, just break down and not work. So as Jenny said enzymes and specifically proteins have specific shapes that causes specific functions. So we can say that the shapes are really crucial to the protein or the enzyme like function and how it works. So just like as Mr. Dubai said, houses can be classified by the number of bedrooms, the proteins can actually have specific structures and it's in different steps so or different levels. So they include primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So the primary is basically the 
the sequencing, sequencing of the protein or the amino acid by translation, transcription and translation of the DNA. And these, and these codons of three, yeah, three codons will cause like one amino acid. And it's just a peptide bond between all these amino acids. Our secondary um, structure is uh, basically hydrogen bond between the amine and the carboxylic group, which is the C CO and the HN. And there's two types of secondary structure, which is alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. This is this curly will be the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets is this one. And the tertiary, which is just you can remember it by here the capitalized R, which is that it's all about the R group, which means that depending on which R group there is in the sequence, the there's the different types of bonds. And the main four is hydrogen, hydrophobic, ionic, and disulfide bonds. And just remember, yeah, van der Waals force is also. And disulfide bond is basically covalent bond, but then just you have to have sulfide, so sulfur in it. And it's the strongest from what I know. Yeah. And quaternary will be between those tertiary structures. Oh, and these are all inter um, intramolecular forces because they're between, be, um, between like in within one molecule, protein molecule. And quaternary is inter, which is between two molecules. So it's like an example, basic example of a quaternary is the hemoglobin, where it's four human groups, the beta and the alpha chains, creates this big protein structure. Yeah, free hugs and four Gs. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, um, all right. So we were talking about how you, after you fold the protein, you can get a quaternary complete structure. And there's two different types, which Jenny said, are fibrous and globular. So uh, globular pro um, enzymes are generally globular proteins. And um, what they do that is that they're biological catalysts. And what they do is speed up or yeah, catalyze a reaction, which is generally done by saying there's like an activation energy that the substrate turns to its product. So it reduces that and makes the, uh, the reaction more likely to go forward. What kind of amino acids lie in the active side of lipase? So, uh, like they're saying, there's uh, different models for possible mechanisms of how enzymes work. And really, um, well, they all agree, right? The enzyme has one major part of the enzyme is the active site, which is where the substrate is going to bind to the enzyme and be changed from, its pro uh, from the substrate to the product. So um, there's lock and key and induced fit. Induced fit's the one that's more popular right now. And basically, this says that the enzyme has a certain specificity for a certain uh, substrate. And what it does is that when it... When it um, when it binds to the substrate, it makes the current uh, chemical bonds in it less less uh, favorable, and the different one, new ones more favorable, which we make into the product. So that's induced fit, and the enzyme isn't um, consumed in the reaction, and also it, uh, it changes shape slightly when it's forming the enzyme uh, substrate compl uh, complex, but then it returns back to its original conformation. Factors that impact uh, enzymes. So one of the main differences between an enzyme and, I guess, if I can talk about it, is that enzymes are different from uh, inorganic uh, catalysts, mostly in that, A, they're typically much more, um, much more effective in that they have much higher uh, reaction rates, are able to make reactions go forward much faster, and also they generally only operate at very mild, uh, mild conditions, or at least some optimum temperature pH. So, you know, pH, I guess the curve here is that for the example, I guess it's around 7, but then, so that would be something like, I guess Emily is in your mouth, is closer to 7. Well, then you have something like, if I get something wrong, someone has to interrupt me, okay? No someone has to interrupt me. Wait, why? You didn't really, you didn't really answer this question. Do you know the answer to it? Oh, like the, the, the they're non-polar? Non -polar? Right, right. Non -polar. Well, oh. you can come back to that again at the end. Okay, yes, those amino acids at the active side of lipase should be non-polar, which is why it has, like, you know, the, uh, the specificity. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to talk about Vmax now because I don't really know. But all right, so if there is no inhibitor, the normal function of an enzyme, but anyway, yeah, so the enzyme, at a certain point, there's just so much substrate, uh, there's too much for that active site. It's not, it's um, even adding more substrate, the enzyme still, uh, the active site still occupies. So adding more substrate won't make it work any faster. So that's Vmax. So... The two different things we talk about then are then, which also impact the 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 uh, impact the reactions that the uh, the efficiency of an enzyme would be the presence of inhibitors, which I guess you know we're supposed to now know a competitive example is the uh, is cyanide and non-competitive is um, PTU, but anyway, so uh, 
one thing we can talk about is, first of all, before we get to VMAX, that competitive inhibitors, the way they work is that they also bind to the active site. So typically, they have similar chemical properties to the substrate. So they're also generally, you know, like temporary. On the other hand, non-competitive, because they bind to an allosteric site, which means they, uh, I guess, on an enzyme somewhere, is this the allosteric site? I don't know. But it has an active site, and some, it binds somewhere else on the enzyme, which is going to change the shape of the active site, and therefore make it unable to function later on. Yeah, that black dot, that's it, yeah. Okay, so that's the allosteric site. Okay, so I guess that would be your uh, non-competitive inhibitor. And that's typically a more permanent effect. So that's going to be uh, the non-competitive inhibitor. So because, like I just said, it's, it's more um, of a permanent effect, it's going to like almost completely disable the enzyme. So therefore, VMAX, like, it's, the, it's, this, it's at the point at which the enzyme um, is completely saturated. So now there's less enzyme active site available for, for, uh, for conversion of the product, of the, of the substrate to the product. So it's not going to be able to uh, convert things as fast. So therefore, your VMAX is much lower here. On the other hand, if it's a, yeah, uh, <laughs> if it's a competitive inhibitor, because they're still ultimately uh, competing for that same spot in the active site, if you have enough substrate, it's going to just kind of overwhelm the uh, amount of uh, inhibitor you have. That's assuming that you keep your inhibitor uh, concentration uh, constant. So if you overwhelm the substrate, at which point it's just going to be not enough inhibitor to make a serious impact on the conversion of substrate to, uh, uh, to product. So that's why this will ultimately still reach Vmax after you overload it with substrate. So the biochem part, though, is like, that's just like Vmax, but then, Vmax. yeah, the Michaelis mentioned equation? Yeah. Half Vmax. Half Vmax. Yeah. Half VMAX. Yeah. VM is half Vmax, isn't that so? Yeah. 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 I don't we know. assume that the VMAX? substrate amount is equal to Km. Yeah, okay, so then that we won't be able to draw it. Yeah, just, just, just write out the equation. Yeah, write out the... the Do I... I don't... Mentor. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's like... Is this... Okay. All I remember is that there's like a... There was like a K or somewhere. You guys look it up and just tell them what to write. Okay. Just tell them what to do, guys. Like, just just tell them everything, you know that. Like, okay. Well, you know max times the concentration of the substrate. V equals... By the way, cyanide. Did I say... I thought it was an idiot. Sorry. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just we'll put a note. We'll put a note. V equals V max times us. Oh, okay. What? Okay. What? So what's that equation? That's the that's the equation. Oh. Okay. And then you talk about the half V max. Do you guys want to know what? Go, Alex. We believe in you. Well, I think the only thing that we don't recognize in this uh, equation, right, is the Michaelis Menten equation which is based off of uh, the steady state assumption, which is just that. So you have substrate, right? You have uh, your substrate uh, enzyme uh, complex, and you also have your products and uh, product there. Yeah. Enzyme substrate. Plus, OK, both of these have enzyme here. Sorry. OK, but then, right, so all these are like uh, in equ equilibrium. So you have these. And then this is a, a forward, the constant, so this is the forward. This is the backwards, this is the forwards, this is the backwards. But typically, after you've made the product, the reaction's not going to run backwards from that, so you can kind of just assume this doesn't really exist. So in which case, um, the Michaelis Menten then is just equal to uh, what we learned before, right? It's product over uh, reactant. So that's going to be equal to um, uh, K negative uh, 1. Yeah, so from the complex, it's K negative 1 plus K2 over K1. So that's your Michaelin, uh, Michaelis Benton uh, constant. But when you're doing the derivation for trying to figure out how to figure out uh, Vmax and Km, right? If you know Vmax for a specific enzyme, then you can find out that okay, Vmax, then you have what? Half Vmax is here. And at that point, this, oh, well, okay, actually you did it. So then V equals max substrate S is Km plus substrate S. Right, so if you pretend the Km was a was substrate concentration, right, then it's 2, so then you cross that out. And it's V max, half V max is equal to Km, right? Yep. So that's, that substrate concentration is equal to Km, because that was your assumption that you made. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But then, yeah, so the only thing we need to know is that, like, if it's competitive, then the Vmax stays the same, but 
but if it's not competitive, the, the KM, uh, yeah, so it's, um, oh yeah, non-competitive VMAX changes, but the KM uh, doesn't change. Well, if it's competitive, the VMAX uh, changes, doesn't change, but the KM does change. Well, right, the half, half VMAX changes, KM doesn't change. Yeah, half no, VMAX. KM changes for competitive. Yeah, can yeah. whatever no, one, can only one of them is the same. Half the same. Yeah. Either, like either of them, the can value is the same. Yeah. Okay. I don't think we did. Oh, we so just, so. What, is, what does the K M value stand for? It's the efficiency of the enzyme. No, it's no, just the uh, like constant. Yeah, yeah. It's a constant. What? It's a constant. Yeah. Well, it is kind of associated with this. It's like a kinetics constant. Yeah. 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 It's kind of. No, but he said it had something to do with efficiency, like if the K M value was no, like if it was higher, higher it was, yeah, it, 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 it is part of the reactor, right? No, it was lower, it would be more efficient. Lower, yeah, lower is more efficient. Yeah, higher, not as efficient. It's still part of, yeah, part of the reactor. So, same thing. Okay. End product inhibition. I don't know what you know about it. It's just that. Okay, one example of end product in inhibition is in glycolysis or in the uh, cellular respiration. You're trying to get ATP at the very end, but once you have a uh, sufficient amount of ATP, it actually acts as an inhibitor uh, to its own production because you have enough. Mm -hmm. So I think ATP stops one of the steps in glycolysis. Right. Yeah. Phosphorus. Yeah. Phosphorus. yeah phosphorus. How is it an example of negative feedback? Oh, because um, the body can sense that, uh, basically, can tell that you have a certain a stimulus above a certain level of well homeostasis. So it. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.